tell us a story. It's a frequent start to any parents with, with children. And storytelling is something we could all learn to do, especially perhaps at this time when we've got lots of time on our hands with the virus uh, emergency and so on. Everybody got time to have a go at writing a story. So I really want to talk for a few minutes about how you might go about that. What's it mean to, to tell a story? They said that people who can tell stories are always favorite guests. Someone who can tell a good joke or a good story is always in demand. And someone who can tell a story which gets people excited and interested has a real gift that, that can be communicated. So I want to get, think about a few reasons why storytelling should be something we could all have a go at. We don't have to be a great pianist or a great painter to write a story. We all write all day long. And with a big piece of paper and a pencil or a pen, we can start to write a story. There's some things we have to get straight before we start then. Who's going to tell the story? Is it going to be me, I was doing this? Or is it going to be you, they, he, she, we? Different ways of telling the story. Some stories are told by the first person. I was there, this happened to me. I came out of the room and this is what I saw. That can be difficult to do. We were looking at the opening of Dickens's Great Expectations, which is told from I, Pip's point of view. More often, people choose he, she, they. We're looking at some people over there. What were they doing? How did they act? What happened to them? And it's easier, perhaps, to, to put it like that. And the same with when it's happening. We can say, I am here. This is happening to me now. Or it did happen to me. It was going on. And again, much more often, I think, we tend to use things in the past. The story took place. It was then. Then he came in. Then this happened, and so on. The word then suggests that too. So maybe the most frequent way of telling a story is from the point of view of he or she or they, and they did this, they were there in the past tense. If you were reading a screenplay, that's the instructions for the way lines are said, the way that, that the script works in a film, you'd see on the corner of any page of screenplay two little things. One, it might say X day, or it might say int night. And the two things that any cameraman would want to know, or any technical people, about any screenplay and about any story, really, is it indoors, internal? Is it in this room? Or is it external? Is it out there on the road, up the garage, up the road there? Internal or external? Is it day or is it night? Is it happening out there, half past one in the morning? Half past one in the evening. Half past one in the morning is night time. Half past one in the afternoon is daytime. So two big decisions to make before we get started then. Where are we, internal or external? Is it day or is it night? On the stage, you talk about a backdrop, and you'd learn something. When the curtain goes back, you'd see the backdrop. It might have some trees. It might suggest a woodland scene. It might have a big set of skyscrapers. We're in a big town. It could be by the seaside. We get all sorts of pictures from the screenplay. And somehow, we've got to work that out for ourselves to the backdrop. Well, we think of weather as well as one thing. It's always useful to say, what kind of day was it? There's a story by the English writer Somerset Maugham called Rain. And it's set in torrential rain, very, very heavy rain on a South Sea island. The word rain occurs 26 times in the first few pages of the story. That gets the idea to the reader what it's about. It's going to be very heavy rain. And everybody's feeling very upset and depressed by all this heavy rain. So the weather, the background, the backdrop in that sense can be very important. Is it to be old or is it to be new? What is, the, is it setting in the past or is it set now? Or is it set in a, a future landscape? Those backdrop parts, again, not very many details, but a few details like that help to make it alive for the reader. And how many characters can we have in a short story? A short story might only be a page. It might be 20 pages. It's not going to be 100 pages or 500 pages or 1,000 pages. It's short. So not many characters, maybe one or two or two or three characters. It doesn't have lots of different relationships, but it must have some, even if it's one person on his own or her own. The Lady with the Little Dog, Chekhov's famous short story, is about a lady who taking her dog for a walk. She's on holiday by the Black Sea in Russia, and she meets this man. 
and what happens after that is the theme of the story she, because she's walking with the little dog and the dog is the sort of link between the two of them. So we want a relationship, we want some simple construct between the various people in the story but not too many of them. Physically what are they like? One or two things about their clothes, their faces, some tiny little details about them which makes them stand out so they're not just blank pages that we in one or two details can make somebody come alive. That's very important too. Short stories we've just said might be half an hour read, 20 minutes read, 10 minutes read. And it's not going to be like a novella which is 100 pages which is two or three hours read or a novel which could be a week's read. So it's got to be something that can be handled pretty quickly. And there are really two main types of short story. One is what we call the slice of life story, which is we come into this room, two or three people are talking, something happens, we learn a bit about them, they're having an argument perhaps, but it hadn't, ends up with a good joke and all's well. A little slice of life, something could happen any, any time. Lesson five, half past 11 on a Monday morning, finishes at 10 past 12. What goes on in that lesson? It's just a snapshot, a slice of life. No terrible dramas, nothing exciting happened, but the excitement is in the ordinary telling of, of events. That's one sort of short story, something like James Joyce's Dubliners, he's an Irish writer. He wrote a whole book of stories about Dublin life. Nothing amazing happens, it's just about people chatting, meeting in the pub, arguing with their children, things like that. And yet it's very, very vivid and very, very tense and, and realistic. On the other hand, you can have a story that has what we call the twist of the knife. The last paragraph suggests something totally different. We build up to it and then we never thought of that. Heavens above, I didn't see that coming. Somebody is totally different from what they're supposed to be. Something falls away and we suddenly realize we've missed the point till that moment. Lots of thrillers are like that, aren't they? Where you get to the point, only in the last page is it clear that the big policeman is actually the murderer in the scene or whatever it is, that the thing is different from what you'd imagine. That's the twist of the knife. Lots of thrillers are like that, lots of sci-fi films, lots of things where we suddenly say, oh, it's totally different. So that's another form of short story we need to think about. Time scale, well, how are we going to make it? Is, it? is it going from beginning to end like that? We've talked about some stories which might end with the beginning or begin with the end. How are we going to work back? Can we work almost to there? Then we flood back. I had a look at two different types of that. One where we really are at the very end of a man's life and how did he get to this position where he's surrounded by police and so on at the top of a building, uh, which we were looking at in, in The Perfect Spy, or how do we get to a position in Cinema Paradiso where the famous film producer is called by his mother back to his little seaside town in Sicily to attend the funeral of somebody he knew 30 years ago. Why has he come back? What flood of memories has it unleashed? And suddenly we're back right at the beginning of his life, having seen him at 55, we then see him age about six. So 50 years folds away like that. So the time scale, how time works in a story, is also important, particularly if you're in the very few pages, you've got to work out how much of time you're going to use. Is it going to be set when? Is it space travelers? Is it going to be in the future? Is, it, is, is time an elastic concept in it? Um, science fiction constantly does that for us, doesn't it? We can just jump in and out of time as we thought. Dialogue, which is written conversation, how much of that do we want in a story? I would suggest very little unless you're a brilliant writer. Writing what people say is very difficult. One line, two lines, very good, but to write pages and pages of people talking, he said, they interrupted, I remarked, you replied, all this is very heavy, heavy going. And when you're reading stories, you don't want all that. You want to know immediately who's there. Occasionally they'll talk, but basically you want to be imagining their conversation, just occasionally break in with some strong narrative. Punctuation is important in that too, so you can see who's talking. Sometimes you read a story, you haven't any idea who's actually saying that to who, and that breaks the whole tension, breaks the whole dream of, of, of the story. So it wants to be clear, and I suggest using dialogue just sometimes. Uh, we were looking at the great expectation. Oh, your noise! It suddenly breaks out after about a page of very slow things, and suddenly we're in a different story. Here's a horrible villainous man shaking and strong and very frightening in the middle of this rather daydreamy start. And that's just one, three words, he says, and that 
immediately takes us into a different mood. So very little use of dialogue. Settings are very important. Where are the stories? Where do they come? And sometimes they're very surprising. I was talking about Rudyard Kipling this morning as a story of his called They. A man in a wonky car, a car breaks down and he wants to get it fixed. He sees this lovely big house just across the road. So he gets out of the car, goes, knocks on the door and asks if somebody could help ring a garage so he could come and mend his car for him. And the lady of the house sits him down beside a big fire. It's a beautiful big room and there's a gallery up, up the stairs and he's there, there waiting and she's making phone call out at the back to the garage to come and mend his car. And he starts to hear footsteps on the gallery. He hears little voices laughing. He sees a little face at the corner of the gallery. And then the lady of the house comes back. So I fixed it all up. The garage is coming in a minute. And the man feels very relieved. He's sitting there, enjoying this beautiful house, and the beautiful fire, and the car problem solved. He said, I so much enjoyed the children running around upstairs. They seem to be so happy up there. And the lady of the house replied, I have no children. And immediately we're into a totally different story then at that point from what seems a very gentle, safe introduction. It changes into something, changes gear, changes dimension. And from that point on, you ought to read it. It's a wonderful story. Another familiar form is something we know about into something we don't know about, just in a turn. For example, the Alice in Wonderland idea or the uh, Wizard of Oz. We're walking along, a little boy, bored with school, and he walks the same way home every day. There's a big wall there, and there's a little green door in the wall. And he's often past it. One day, particularly bored, he plucks up courage to open the green door. And inside, it's an absolutely amazing world. There are lions wandering around. There are great big plants and trees everywhere. There are all sorts of strange people, unicorns, all kinds of mystical animals in there. He's absolutely flabbergasted. It's an absolutely dream, wonderful world. So wonderful, he can't bear to be there for very long. So after about 10 minutes, he comes along and shuts the door behind him. But now he's got it in his head. And the next day, he can't wait for the end of school. He walks back the familiar way he's always walked to that wall. And there is no green door. He can't find the green door. He can never find that green door again, the door to another world. Except 50, 60 years on, he's a very successful politician with a very big decision to take. And he's walking the streets of London, thinking about how should he decide this. It literally decide the fate of his country, this decision. Walking along, he suddenly sees a wall he remembers. And then he sees the green door in the wall. And so he opens the door and steps through the green door. You'll have to read the end of the story to see what happens there. But again, we're shifted into a totally different mood by that other world that's just so near the real world. That's a story by H.G. Wells, who we think of as a science fiction writer, The War of the Worlds and so on, but actually wrote wonderful other types of stories too. Don't be afraid to borrow, to steal from other people. We all do that all day long. Shakespeare pinched all his plots from other people. Didn't, nobody could care less. You don't go to Shakespeare for the history of England. You go because of the wonderful characters he creates around the history and so on. So we, we all m must use other people. Why not bring some real people into your stories? Occasionally have some famous person coming into your ordinary little world. That can be an interesting uh, dialogue between two different sorts of people. But places, events, characters, they can all be stolen, borrowed from others. And it's good fun to do that. So don't be worrying. Somebody said there are only 10 stories in the world, or something like that. So we're not going to invent something totally new. We are doing a variation on a theme. That's, that's what a storyteller is doing. Characters. We all know what a, a very vicious character is, a very jealous character is, a very vain, a very arrogant person is. There are lots of them in literature. We can borrow people like that. Or we can borrow from life, people we know. There are always people that, that we can bring into our stories. I think we have to remember Chekhov's gun. Anton Chekhov is a great Russian playwright. And he said, don't put a gun up on the wall, on a wall bracket in a play, in Act 1, so everybody can see it in the audience, 
unless in Act 2 you're going to take the gun down and fire and kill somebody with it. There's no point in having a big detail in a story unless you're going to use it. And I think that's a very, very good model for writing stories, that don't bring in details unless they matter. We've all seen, I'm sure, thrillers where suddenly you're looking at somebody's red shoes. The camera points down at that for no reason. And yet it's in the back of your mind. And you don't hear anything about it, perhaps for another whole episode, and suddenly those red shoes appear somewhere. That's Chekhov's gun because that point was there for a reason, it's going to be used later. So you don't bring in a, a, a very little detail for no reason in a short story. You do it because you're going to use it later on. You don't waste material like that. I think that's very important for how you write stories. And finally, mood, I think, is very important. Are we going to start softly, get louder? Are we going to start with something that's growing in tension? Or are we going to lower the tension down? Like in the way music works, you can use ups and downs, louds and softs, growing and getting quieter. All these different moods you can use as a writer very quickly to give, create different moods, different tensions, different feel, different atmosphere to your stories. So there are many different ways you can, can write the story. And it can change mood literally in an instant. So I'm trying to give a few broad ideas of how you might start to write a story. And the whole thing is we can all do it. We're all writers, really. We might not be very good writers. We're not going to make our money by writing stories. But it's a wonderfully therapeutic thing to do, a wonderful thing to do, particularly now we've got some time on our hands, to sit down and say, well, let's write a story. Let's do We're sitting in a room with a knock on the door. Who would it be? Why has she turned up? And so on. And I haven't seen her for so long. And what's her story in the meantime? And so on. And we're suddenly away within five lines. We've started a story. So I hope everybody will start to be storytellers and get back to one of the oldest knacks in the world, really, of learning to entertain each other by story. Just as we were saying, Steven Spielberg would have probably written novels. Certainly, Charles Dickens would have written film screenplays by the dozen if he'd been alive now and made even more money than he did as a writer because he has a wonderful narrative gift. This is a story that he wrote relatively late in life, in 1861. He was very famous by that time. His marriage had broken up disastrously. He'd run off with a 19-year-old girl in total secrecy in, in, in England at the time. That would have been the most awful thing anybody could have done. Uh, he didn't dare make that public. So he's living a kind of shadowy life with a false name. Uh, and this is the most famous person uh, probably in England at the time, apart from Queen Victoria. So he was a very, very, very well-known person. As he says, actually, interestingly, in the first paragraph of this, this is before photographs. We hardly think of a world before photographs, but people didn't know what other people looked like, really, except from a few people who had their painting, their portrait paintings done. So we have a picture here in the beginning of this story of a young boy. Dickens again and again returns to this idea of a young, rather vulnerable guy. His name is Pip in the story, and he's an orphan. His mother's sort of there, Mrs. Joe. Uh, is it his mother? No, it's not really his mother. It's someone who's adopted him. And she has a husband, Mr. Joe. And they sort of bring Pip up, not very happily, but he's sort of up, brought up by them. The wife, mother, Mrs. Joe, is very fierce, very tough with him. Poor Joe is a blacksmith. He puts shoes on horses, that's what a blacksmith does. He works physically. He's a very strong guy, but very weak mentally, he's bullied by her all day long. And so the happy family life really eludes Pip. And he lives in Essex, just 50 miles from London, out on the east coast, by the marshes out there. And a lonely boy, sometimes even rather gruesomely, goes to the churchyard to see where his mum and dad are buried. Uh, and he looks at the gravestones. And there are also five other gravestones. Have, all his brothers and sisters are buried there as well. In Victorian times, the whole families could be buried together. So it's rather a slow, boring start to the story, you might think. And you might just beginning to turn off after three paragraphs. And then suddenly, the mood changes because we meet the other character who's going to dominate the whole story. And within a page, I think marvelously, Dickens has changed the mood completely. Just let me read it to you and follow the, follow the text and see if you see what I mean and how he uses dialogue to get going. Written entirely in the first person. This is from Pip's point of view. 
My father's family name being Pirip, and my Christian name Philip, my infant tongue could make of both names nothing longer or more explicit than Pip. So I called myself Pip and came to be called Pip. I give Pirip as my father's family name on the authority of his tombstone and my sister, Mrs. Jo Gargery, who married the blacksmith. As I never saw my father or my mother, and never saw any likeness of either of them, for their days were long before the days of photographs, my first fancies regarding what they were like were unreasonably derived from their tombstones. The shape of the letters on my father's gave me an odd idea that he was a square, stout, dark man with curly black hair. From the character and turn of the inscription, also Georgiana, wife of the above, I drew a childish conclusion that my mother was freckled and sickly. To five little stone lozenges, each about a foot and a half long, which were arranged in a neat row beside their grave and were sacred to the memory of five little brothers of mine who gave up trying to get a living exceedingly early in that universal struggle. I'm indebted for a belief I religiously entertained that they'd all been born on their backs with their hands in their trousers pockets and had never taken them out in this state of existence. Ours was the marsh country.